what I'd like to do tonight is take you through the elements of theology. But obviously, that's too great a task. So I narrowed it down, and I'd like to show you how to get into Proclus' elements of theology, how to get into it. And therefore, strictly speaking, it's not a lecture which is to persuade, but a demonstration. So I'm going to take an example, and I'm going to try to open it up, and through that, I hope it will then be an avenue for you to travel into this curious world, the Proclus. Now, one word. The elements of theology. Theology doesn't mean God as God. It really means a study of the divine. It includes references to God, but essentially it's the elements of and the study of, theology, the study of the divine by identifying its elements. So this is the way I would like to bring you into it. First, the fundamental, the fundamental, most fundamental element in all Proclus's elements of theology and the Neoplatonic thought is analogy. Now, it all comes from and goes back to Plato's Timaeus. And the most beautiful of bonds is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the things which it binds together. And to effect this in the most beautiful manner is the natural property of analogy. Now, we have to show, we have to show that by the study of analogy, this is not rhetoric, but this is most accurate and precise language. So we have to show that there's a natural intrinsic bond to analogy. It perfectly unites into one, so it's a way of unifying both itself and the things which it relates. All right. It binds it all together and that's the natural property of analogy. With one major word, somehow we have to show that intrinsic, intrinsic to analogy is beauty. Now, if we can do all that, all right, that'll be a stepping stone into Proclus. All right, now how are we going to do it? First, I'd like to make a very straightforward, simple Intro to analogy. There are two laws of transformation. Switching terms within a ratio and between the ratios. Now, a ratio is any two things that are related. A is to B. That's a ratio. I can represent that with just two dots. So A is to B is equal, we can equally can change that to B is to A. Now look here. As C is to D. Well, look here. This is a ratio. This is a ratio. Therefore, we can switch the terms within the ratio, switch them around, and we have a new form of the original analogy. Second, we can connect connecting the terms between the ratios, but keeping the order of the relation constant. What does that mean? All right. That means we can now connect terms between ratios. If I take the first here, I take the first here. If I take the second here, I take the second and the second ratio. So therefore I've generated another one. A is to C, right, as B is to D. All right. Now, what's the two rules? You switch the terms within the ratio. That's within the ratio. Or you connect them between the ratios. So long as you, so long as you follow the rule, 
that you must keep the order of the relations constant. So whatever you do in one, you must do in the other. In other words, we can equally say D is to B, if that's the order we're taking it in, then C is to A. Whatever order we start with, we must duplicate in the second ratio. Now, this is a four-term analogy. We could put it classically as the shepherd is to sheep as the ruler is to his subjects, or we could put it with numbers and say two is to four as three is to six, because analogies can use three terms. It can use symbols, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, numbers, <coughs> Two is to four is three is to six. Ideas, shepherd is to sheep as ruler is to his subjects. Now that's a four terminology. Now what we did last week was study the republic and the whole republic, the task of the dialectic is nothing other than taking these four terms and placing in them the ideas, knowledge, understanding, belief, image thinking. And what does he tell us to do? Show all the ways in which you can relate the terms. Well, that's formally eight ways. You can relate them eight ways. These are three. If you follow these two rules, you can see you can generate eight transformations of a four-term analogy. Now, we are going to spend our time for a while on the three-term analogy because that's essential to Proclus' theology. Now, notice this is four terms here, and now I'm going to change it. Same rules of transformation. <clears throat> Same rules. Three terms. A, B, C. Therefore, we can say A is to B as B is to C three terms. Now, this is called the mean analogy because these terms are called the extremes. These are called the means. Therefore, this is called the three term analogy. It's also called a mean <coughs> analogy. Following these, we'll show the four transformations that a mean analogy can take. All right? We'll represent it, A is to B, as B is to C. What's our first rule? Switch the terms. B is to A, switch the terms. C is to B. Now look here, if we take these terms alternately, A is to B, as B is to C, we'll have the same one we started with, and therefore it's not transformed. There's four Therefore, we have to do it with this one. Therefore, taking the terms alternately, B is to C as A is to B. What do we do now? We can switch the terms following rule number one. Therefore, C is to B as B is to A. Those are the only valid transformations of a three term analogy. So what? Well, watch what happens now. Remember what problem we're working on. Whether or not we can see that the very form of analogy contains within it, intrinsically, the property of beauty. That was our task, was it not? Well, let's first quickly go over it and do it again, just so you can see it once more fresh. There's my original three-term analogy called the mean analogy. What's the first thing I do? What's the first thing I do? Switch the terms within the ratio. This is a ratio. This is a ratio. Therefore, I could equally say, what do I do next? I take the, connect the terms between the ratios. Therefore, it's going to be B, C, A, B. Agree? Now that I've done that, what can I do? Switch them again. Now, try it. When you go home, try it. See whether you can generate anything other than these four.
by following these rules. I think you will see that those are the only possibilities. Now, let me raise an issue for you. All right? I, yes, sir. It sounds like the Muslims say God is God, which is completely, to me, meaningless. They say God is God. Oh, but this will, this will say something far more interesting than that. Watch. <clears throat> Would you agree that if we want to say something is beautiful, it's likely to have at least four qualities to it? Right? There should be some order, some pattern. Right? Some balance and symmetry. Agree? Those are usually the classic signs of something being beautiful. Okay, now, this, the transformations of amenology has a double symmetry, very unusual. It doesn't have symmetry, it has a double symmetry. Watch. A is in the first place, second place, third place, fourth place. Would you agree if, a, if a, any object has symmetry, we should be able to draw an axis through it and fold it over and superimpo have a superimposition of the points one with the other, such as if you have a face, right? If you make a axis, passing it through vertically, you can then, as it were, fold it over and therefore there should be a superimposition of all the points of the one upon the other. Notice this only has one axis. You can't do it this way, can you? No. Otherwise you'd have a head on the top of your head. I mean a mouth on top of your head, and that would be rather inconvenient. So that has single symmetry. But look at this. Would you agree we can now fold this over? C is C, B, B, right? Would you agree? Splendid. By the way, doesn't it have another line of symmetry? Can we not do the same thing with C's? Fold it over. Would you agree? I'm in trouble with the term transformation because I would call that manipulation. If you, as long as you mean by manipulation, simply the folding over. Because a transformation to me means that you don't see the butterfly in the caterpillar. Oh, you're because quite you right. That's. Uh, that's a different kind of transformation. You're absolutely right. That's right. Okay, so you're not talking about that's that right. kind of That's right. That's right. You're quite right. That's right. This different kind. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you holding it along the axis of the C then? Well, do it. What would happen if you were to do that? Instead of this way, it's like... If, you, if C, you'd have to pick up this and fold it over here, wouldn't you? Right. Would you have A on top of A? Right. Would you have B on top of B? Right. B on top of B, and so on? Yeah. Ah. Would you agree, double symmetry? Yeah. Look here. Let's take a look at this. Would you agree there's something curious here? Here are the extreme terms, A and C. Would you agree they become the mean terms They become the mean terms. Look at this, we have something else that's curious. Look what happens to B. B circles the entire thing. Is that an interesting property? Interesting pattern. Uh, a and B is a ratio. Remember when we switch the terms within the ratio? That's this, isn't it? Do you see that that moves from the antecedent position to the subsequent? A is to B is B is to A. A is to B is B is to A. Right. What do you think happens then to the ratio B is to C? C is to B. It moves, does it not? We can see it duplicated here. Right? Ah, therefore, would you not agree? Take the face. 
you can't say that this side all right let's see if I can make my face once again so we can see it a face is a good example or a tree right a face or a tree right. notice that we can't there's a certain number of things in this quadrant and differs from this side doesn't it it's top heavy isn't it in terms of the number of things in the space in which it occupies therefore it has a balance going left to right in the upper quadrants but not lower therefore this has a balance doesn't it as it switches from one to the other it has a double symmetry it has a balance it has an interesting pattern now look here there's something else that's curious do you see this the way these terms proceed now we're taking the terms in the way in which we generated them we're taking the terms in the way in which we generated them a is to b is b is to c do you see this line a is to b is b is to c notice it's the opposite it's the opposite here look here <laughs> a is to b is b is to c c is to b is b is to a look here a is to b is b is to c so equally this way isn't it a is to b is b is to c would you expect this to be true as well that's right would you expect this to be true would you expect this to be true well let's see a is to b is b is to c a is to b is b is to c same thing going laterally and horizontally hey c is to b is b is to a by heavens good night what do you know about that right but look here a is to b is b is to c the opposite c is to b is b is to a uh, c is to b is b is to a same thing going this way isn't it c is to b is b is to a right c is to b is b is to a agree B is to A is C is to B. It's exactly the opposite of that. Going the other way is this, isn't it? You also have the relationships going this way. Wait a minute. This term, A, B, B, C, my extreme terms, my extreme terms are A and B. They shift, do they not, to the middle position? My good heavens. So therefore, my extremes and means change, do they not? Does that show a great deal of order? Does that show a great deal of patterns which are apparent? Wait a minute. What did we say about this? If we can show some way of indicating these properties, what must it have intrinsically? Beauty. Now look here. Try this now. If anyone has an eye for this, they can use it. If you can find, if you can find three terms that can be arranged proportionally in a mean analogy then you know artistically if you move them around there are only four combinations you can have you've exhausted all the possibilities and whatever you produce will naturally have an aesthetic will it not because the structure has an aesthetic a beauty now who does that this comes from Socrates' symposium, Plato's symposium. All right, let's take a look at it, all right? He arranges his terms into a mean analogy. His teacher was a woman, Diotima Amantonina. Therefore, she is the teacher, he is the student, and she takes him through a whole dialogue that took quite a bit of time over and over again exploring the nature of love and its relationship to ultimate reality she develops what we would call today an intellectual yoga a very fine one based upon eros so this dialogue shows eros and its relationship as a yoga to reach a glimpse 
into the nature of ultimate reality. Now, Socrates then in turn reports that he followed the same process going through the similar steps that Diotima took him through, only he takes someone else through called the Agathon. So Socrates then becomes a teacher and he functions with Agathon in a similar way that Diotima related with him. Ah, now look here. I want to use this and then I'm going to replace it with other terms and you will see that we can use this with a replacement of other terms move right into theology. What are we going to do? We're going to substitute terms because the relations are constant. If we identify the constant relationships we just substitute terms and the same thing can be said. In other words, this one equally could be true for 2 is to 4 is 3 is to 6. Because in terms and analogy can either be numbers, symbols, or ideas. Now we need a vocabulary to explain how Diotima relates with Socrates and in turn Socrates with Agathon. That's our goal. Now, I have a couple of terms I thought I'd like to introduce. All right, here we go. I'm going to use all of these terms. Now, Tiatema is the highest term. She is the master teacher. What she has within herself has great power. And her teaching has great power. And it is together, all of the ideas that she possesses are together in a unity. Therefore, her teaching has great unitary power or potency. I'm going to indicate that in this way. <clears throat> now, she communicates the unity of that teaching to Socrates. Socrates, in communicating that to Agathon, we can then see that there's a communication of this unity that proceeds through the entire order of terms. Since her teaching then is passed on to Socrates as a teacher as he relates to Agathon. In communicating its unity to the entire order, she then unifies, she then unifies all of these together into a union. That's what she's able to do. Because that's a transmission of a teaching. That's a Dharma transmission, and that's what it does classically, be it in Plato or in Buddhism or in any other system. Now, let's take a look at a curious idea. Now, let's take a look now at the model we had a moment ago. I want to put it up here again, and I want to talk about it, and then I'm going to switch back to these terms four dots of course represents as two dots of course represent is two this was our model now notice a mean term all right, two is to four is three is to, uh, two is to four is four is to eight, all right? Two is to four is four is to eight, all right? Using the same terms as our mean term. What does a mean term do in a mean analogy? All right, look here. The mean term, Socrates reaches out to Diotima and he also reaches out in turn to Agathon. So, he's reaching out to both extremes. That's the mean term. By doing that, he links them together, right? The mean term then links them together because by reaching out to this extreme and this extreme, he then links them all together, doesn't he? 
That's what the mean term does. It links together into a unity. That's what it does. Therefore, the mean term becomes the mediator, the middle, the mediator. That's what it is. It's a mediator between the two extremes. And you know what it does? Look what he does. Socrates receives the teachings of Diotima. He transmits what he received, the gift that he received, to Agathon. Therefore, he transmits the bestowal, that's a bestowal, right? Upon Agathon. That's what a mean term always does. What does it do? It transmits what was given to another. What does that do? That draws the student, Agathon, upward. It draws the potential out of him and makes him see what he never thought was possible to see. Therefore, he draws upwards the potentiality that existed within him, and in that way, you know what happens? A common character runs through the whole thing. Philosophy. It implants a common character, and it turns upon itself, because, see, in that reaching out to both extremes, he brings them together, Therefore, he not only implants a common character, but brings it together into a common nexus, a connection. It connects. Remember the term we used before? It links together. Links together. So it's a common connection. So we might be able to put it this way, all right? That uh, Diotima, Socrates, Socrates, Agathon, or you and I, the students, this links together, see? It links together. It links them all together. It links them together. That's what it does. That's what the mean term does. It links them all together. It implants a common character. The whole thing is, is, is successfully passing on this teaching, right? And therefore, these two, right, what happens? They converge towards the center, towards the mean. Now, what does that do? How does that accomplish? You see, now we can talk about the extreme term. <clears throat> Sometimes this is called the limiting term. Last term is often called the limiting term. What does limiting term do? <clears throat> the limiting term, now we have to talk about two words now, likeness and convergence. Likeness is a technical term in philosophy. Let's show you how it relates, all right? Watch. A shepherd is to his sheep as a ruler is to his subjects. <clears throat> a likeness in philosophy is taking the four terminology, expressing the alternate terms with the word like. Therefore, I can say, a shepherd is like a ruler, sheep are like subjects, I can say subjects are like sheep and rulers are like shepherds. What do I do? I select the alternate terms and instead of using is to, I take it out and I substitute the word like and that's a simile. Simile expresses likeness. What's the principle? In any analogy of four terms, or three, by the way, right, what do I do? I must always take the alternate terms, substitute like for is to, and I have the use of the word like, and that means I've generated likenesses in a simile, or as a simile, right? Okay. These are four terms. Same thing is true, hey, same thing is true for three terms. Now, notice this is the same. but they're different because they function differently. Same term, function differently, as we have here. The first mean term is Socrates, Socrates as a student, right? So therefore it's Socrates as a subscript S for student, right? As Socrates is to a teacher, subscript T. Therefore, now taking the middle terms, Alternate terms, Diotima is like Socrates, Socrates is like Diotima. But only if you take the third, third place. 
Right? Agree? Or you can say, Socrates as a student is like Agathon as a student. Agathon as a student is like Socrates as a student. Therefore, look here. The third term, therefore, allows a likeness. Because notice, unless you had the third term here, Diotima, the teacher, is to Socrates, the student, as Socrates matures and grasps the significance of the teaching, he in turn becomes a teacher. No student. Doesn't make any sense. Therefore, the third term, the third term, of course, this is the fourth place for the third term, allows for the existence of likeness. Because now we can say, putting in Agathon here, Agathon is a student, just like Socrates was a student. Once we say that, we can also say Socrates, the teacher, is now like Diotima, as a teacher. Now we can compare them since they now function in a similar way. Now look here. <laughs> Convergence. With that limiting term, with that limiting term, it makes the entire order a single unitary whole, doesn't it? A teaching must be a transmission. And therefore, this is an original teaching and the transmission. Therefore, it expresses a likeness and convergence. How does it do that? How did Agathon do it? Or how, in principle, does any student receive the transmission of a teaching? Right? By reverting, by reverting, by reverting, by reverting on the principles of what is being taught to him, and, of course, what was taught to him, by reverting upon the initial principles and carrying back, remember what we did before? Carrying back the potentiality that has emerged from it, carrying it back, then Agathon now, to the degree that he then manifests this, he becomes like Socrates the teacher, and therefore he can start, and again, a chain where he becomes the teacher and someone else becomes the student. Well, let me ask you now. We have used these terms. Do you see how I use these terms? Well, we can do it, can't we? We had a little fun doing it. Okay, going to go the next step until I get a question. Go ahead. Just carrying, carrying back to it, I'm not sure how the Sabbath Agathon yes. makes when he, yeah, he re, re, would you agree he has to he has to revert on the initial principles he has to concern himself with the original okay. principles the initial principles he has to be drawn to them and consider them yes. all right as he does that he then develops doesn't he yes he does all right in developing then he in turn is carrying back to this system, those principles. What does that mean? Let's try it, all right? Agathon must revert back on the initial principles that were being taught, right? He then reflects upon the nature of Eros and the whole way to enlightenment, which is the object of the, the study of the symposium, right? And to that degree, he's emerging, is he not? He's emerging. By emerging, what is he doing? He is, in some way, becoming like, like Socrates. He's becoming like Socrates as a student. He's becoming, to the degree to which he can pass it on to someone else, like the teacher, Socrates as a teacher. Therefore, he is now doing what? What kind of language should we use to, to describe that? Uh, would you agree? We're now wondering about carrying back to it. Um, Let's see if we can use alternate terms and then go back to that. <clears throat> there is a potential that is now actualized. All right. There was a possibility that emerged that became actual. All right. How did he do that? He reverted back on the initial principles and then he has to then consider himself within this system, doesn't he? He now has to consider himself part of this entire order. 
when he considers himself then as part of the entire order, then he is becoming part of that order. Now what language shall we use to capture that? He is now part of the entire order and can play a role within it. Some kind of conversion. Some kind of transformation. So let's hold this term and say it's clumsy. We don't have to force it. But that's what we mean by it. Yeah, okay? What about Aristotle? It didn't work for him. Are we actually Listen, happy? you are absolutely right. Aristotle never made it. He never made it. Even though he was a nice guy and all of that, no, he never made it. Yeah. Now look here. Now let's see if we can make a couple of conclusions. Okay, now. I'm going to use three terms, unifying potency, connective function, reversion of the end upon the initial terms. Okay, think about it, take a look at it. Thus, through the unifying, see, now the entire rank, the entire rank, remember we said becomes a union, they all join a certain rank within a union. Therefore, in this process, they become one. Now, look here. In becoming one, then the initial term, the highest term, diatima, right? It was because of the unifying potency that she had that she was able to unite all of these. Do you agree with that? Two, it was through the connective function of the mean term being able to grasp both, link them all together, right? Transmit the bestowals of what was given to him on to his successor, implanting in all a common character, agree a mutual nexus, so that givers and receivers could constitute a single coal, a single and entire, uh, pardon me, a single and entire whole, right? Hey, and would you agree the last term, there was a reversion upon the end, right? A reversion of the end upon the beginning because Agathon has to revert back to the initial principles that started the whole thing going, and if that were impossible, therefore it would not be possible for him to become a student in this entire system, since the system presupposes there is something that is being transmitted through the entire rank. Agree? Now look here, I wonder whether you would like to read a paragraph for me. That fair? Lucky enough, I happen to have it with me. <laughs> Just by accident, I happen to have a paragraph with me. I'm now going to see whether I can now take you through the 148th proposition in Proclus. Now, he's got 211 of them. Formidable. So we're jumping more than the middle. Now, on page 2 in bold type, you'll see number 148. Please take a look at it. Could you pass one over, please? Good, good, good. Ready? All right. Let's read together. 148. <clears throat> That's the second page. Bold print. I wonder whether you'll agree with the first statement. Every divine order has a, has a unifying potency of a threefold origin with its highest term, its mean, and the last term. Is that what we're saying? Why, well, look here. What does he say about the highest term? What does he say about the highest term? The highest term, right? What does it have? A unifying potency. It has a unifying potency. What does it do with that unifying potency? It communicates it to the entire order. Is that right? To the whole. What does that do as a consequence? It unifies the whole, doesn't it? While it's self-remaining independent of it. Is that correct? Yes. 
Hey, the mean term. Take a look at the mean term. Socrates, the mean term. It reaches out to both extremes. See it? Reaching out to both extremes. Linking itself together, right? You see it linking itself together? Right, with itself as a mediator. What does it do? It transmits the bestowals that it has received on, does it not? Wait a minute. If it's able to transmit the bestowals that it itself has received, the consequence of that is quite interesting. What should it be able to do? What should it be able to do? It implants in all a common character, doesn't it? And it has a mutual nexus and, con and connection, doesn't it? Wow! Huh. Well, in this way, I guess you'd say receivers, receivers and givers constitute a single complete whole, an order, doesn't it? Right, is that right? By gosh, it does, doesn't it? Is that what we said? Oh, because of what reason? How is it functioning? For or because? Because? The two extremes are functioning separately because? Yeah, next line, because, for, he doesn't use the word for and because. Watch, you can follow the entire dialogue, see? That's right, because it converges on the mean turn as if upon a center, right? It converges, would you agree? <whistles> converges upon it as if it were the center. Naturally enough, doesn't it? That's what it does. Hey, the last term, agathon, right? You know what it produces? It produces a likeness, doesn't he become like Socrates? And a convergence? How does he do that? Not by reverting on the initial principles, is it? Is that what he does? Why, that's what? <laughs> Just a the mean term's function to create a center? Is that what you're saying? Did I say the mean term functions as a center? Uh, I'm sorry, the, extre the extremes function separately to create a center? Converge. 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 Well, the limiting term yeah. produces a likeness and a convergence. Okay. The limiting term. Yeah, that's the that third term. The right. 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 That's right. Now we're going into the transference. Because that last term has to become like, doesn't it? It has to become like. Okay. And that yeah, means there must be a convergence to that middle terms. Yes. Yes, good, 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 good. And all we're doing is understanding this analogy, are we not? Yes. How does diatema remain independent? Well, look here. That's a very important point. Would you agree? that even though she is the great teacher teaching Socrates, uh, there is always more that the master knows than is ever passed to the student. And in that sense, she transcends the, the student. She says that in symposium. Pardon me? She says that in symposium. She says, uh, there is something I see that maybe even you can't see. I think she says something. Mm. Yeah, she says, I don't know whether Socrates will you ever become an adept. That's right. Right, she doesn't know because he's still a student. That's right. And therefore she far as transcends him in both breadth of knowledge and the, and the ability to translate it into a teaching situation. That's right. Therefore she stands far above them. Another way of looking at it dramatically, you know, Plato always goes for the dramatic aspect of it as well. You see, there's, uh, here, no getting a little sloppy here, so let's clean it up for a moment, and I'll sh do something else. You see, when you look at this, another way of looking at this is to say, notice the relationships that are necessarily implied by this analogy. You can make a study of the two teachers, the way Diotima relates to Socrates and the way Socrates relates to Diotima as teachers. You can see the way Diotima as a teacher relates to Socrates as a student and the way Socrates relates to Diotima as a student. 
we can see equally well, now that Socrates is a teacher, how he relates to Agathon and how Agathon relates to Socrates. Therefore, we can compare the way Socrates relates to Agathon with the way Diotima related to Socrates. We can compare them both, can't we, as ratios. Ha! You know what else we can see? We can see the way Agathon relates to Socrates, right? We can see, if we wanted to make a study, and say, how was Socrates as a student in the earliest days as compared with Agathon when he started this game of philosophy? Well, that's this comparison. Therefore, we can make another comparison this way, can't we? That's the, that's the light, isn't it? That's the light. Agathon yeah, that's the light. Socrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two is to four. The second place, the fourth place. That's right. right. Now, notice, we can see this relationship backwards and forwards. We can see it this way, but there's no possible relationship this way. No, not without the mean. And that's why she stands aloof, above. That relationship is never expressed in the dialogue and that fits the property of analogy. For there is no relationship between A and C. And, and right, there's no, no relationship between A and C. Right, there's no A and C. That's invalid. So therefore he preserves that intrinsic property dramatically in the dialogue by making sure that in the drama of the dialogue they never relate and they don't interrelate on any level. Right. Well, well, I just thought I had a student. Could we carry it on into uh, maybe if I had a student, wherever? Well, that's, see, uh, what's interesting, of course, about the dialogue is that we are Agathon. Yeah, really. And it's our challenge to pass it on. And that's what Socrates, uh, Plato through Socrates is doing. Right, so the next step is, we're here. This is us. We us. That's us. We us. New term, we us, right? And therefore, to the degree that we can understand this and pass it on, we're fitting into that, what's sometimes called the golden chain in philosophy. Right. Ah, now look here. If that's what it is, then this entire thing becomes a one, doesn't it? A oneness. Now, wait a minute. Now, can you read 148 and then is it clear? Is the whole thing clear? In other words, now you can read it with this in mind and you can substitute, can you not? And the whole thing should be then? What? Not simple, but you should be able to see through it and seem to see the same relations. In other words, now we can put other terms in here, so long it's a mean analogy, and we can conclude with these three, and we can use this language and talk about it, can we not? That's how they play the game of metaphysics. That's Proclus' elements of theology. Now, let's go back, all right? These terms, suppose for a moment you wanted to say, I would like to know more about this idea of the highest term. Uh, what do we really mean by it? Oh, well, you'd open up Proclus. That's Proposition 130. He has a whole de development of what he means by the highest term. He puts it in an analogy and talks about it. Look here. Unitary potency. That's an interesting idea. Where does he talk about that? 133. You can put these numbers. In other words, you can take the rest of Proclus and see it behind each one of these major terms. And therefore, you can go through that doorway and see what he means by each of these terms. That's how he's built. That's how he wrote it. All right. It communicates its unity to the entire order and unifies the whole from above while remaining independent of it. Does he go into that in depth somewhere else? Yes, 125. Therefore, you can take this 148, you see, and you can put in these numbers within it. You can open up Proclus's Elements of Theology and go into a greater detail and expand it in order to get a clearer idea of these key terms. Look here. Secondly, the mean term, reaching out 
towards both extremes, links the whole together with itself as mediator, 132. It transmits the bestowals of the first member of its order, 131. Now, notice what I've done in the next paragraph. 130. All right. Let's take a look at what he means by the highest term. All right. If we opened up the book to 130, all right, this is the way he talks about the highest term. In an analogy, an analogical structure that has these qualities, the highest term, the highest term must be perfect. If it's perfect, it has the following qualities to it. All right. There are three ways in which it can be. It either can be full, all right. It can be short of full or in some sense deficient. Three, it can be an overflow. Now, if it's the highest term, and if it's full, then it's unfit for communicating for it, because to communicate means you can go beyond yourself and share with another. That means if you then are full and you communicate, it's going to drain you. If you are already deficient and you're communicating, it's going to drain you further and therefore make you more imperfect. Therefore, to communicate most fully means there's an overflow and one never experiences any deficiency as a result of it's a natural overflowing. Therefore, the highest term must have the capacity of being overflowing spontaneously, fully that means, and through that overflow there's a communication with those that can participate in it. Therefore, the highest term must have a superabundance. Ah, therefore, Diotima, right, must have that teaching in such a way that it can flow out of her, it's no drain, she can do it all night, doesn't bother her, right? It's a natural overflow, a superabundance. Now, in this game, let's look at the word bestowal. That's a key word, isn't it, right? Bestowal. Right. Unfortunately, I didn't put it here, but there, oh, there it is. Transmits the bestowal. Ah, got it. Interesting idea, bestowal. <clears throat> First, it must be full before the bestowal, but what it bestows in Plato, <clears throat> whenever there's a higher and a lower, and there's some communication between them, or participation in it, keyword, participation in it, then you can always say something rather interesting about it. Let's see if we can do it together. Now, obviously, um, this applies on many, many levels, from the highest to the physical. Right. Now, if this is the higher, and this is the lower, now, we can talk about this metaphysically, we can talk about it as God, we can talk about it as unity, we can talk about it as intelligence, we can talk about it as soul, we can talk about it soul and body, it doesn't make any difference, the same qualities, the same things can be said about it. Terms may vary, but the relationships are constant. All right, look here. Whatever is the essential nature of the higher, becomes the character of the lower. That's all. Therefore, you see, if it transmits the bestowals, it's really transmitting a character. Because a character must be what? When the higher transmits, or through the participation of the lower into the higher, whatever this is, whatever particular quality, pun not quality, whatever it is in its own nature, through the participation of another, it gains the characteristic, see, the characteristic of the higher. Now, this we can use this. All right, take a look at the next point. All right, I have it here, right there. 
the divine orders are bound together by mean terms. Shall we? Let's jump up and get a high one and then use another one. All right, let's do that, just to mix it up a bit. All right, okay. I thought we just agreed that the uh, diatim was always greater than any of the uh, lower ones. Oh, yes. So therefore, Agathon can never, he's always, always diminishing returns starts coming in. That's right, that's right. That's why he can't go to Diotima. He can become like Socrates. And then if he's like Socrates, he then has to go the next step and do not only what he has done to become like Socrates, he has to become like what Diotima did to Socrates. Yeah? Is it just accepted that the higher cannot be drained by the yes. lower? Yes. As accepted be as um, dogma? No, well, yes and no. A dogma, meaning it as a teaching, yes, it does it in this way. All right? Um, um, this is really fundamental, the fundamental principle of all of this and what makes classic philosophy so different from modern philosophy, the essential, one of the essential differences is the idea of cause and effect. Right. Now, in this system, the cause, this is the cause, all right? uh, whatever is the cause of something, all right, whatever it is, let us say, if we can represent, well, we can represent it, all right. Uh, there is something. Within it, there are things that are causes. If there is a sufficient power, these causes then can become manifest. Watch a seed through a tree. Yeah, that's right, seed and tree. All right. In this game, the cause is always greater than its effect. Now, we have an idea of cause, two ideas of cause in the modern world. One is that we don't want to talk about causes anymore, we talk about correlations. So let's drop that one out as not too significant. All right? But the other notion of cause is <coughs> evolution. That there is something that is evolving in the effect that is always greater than its cause. That's fundamental to modern view. All right. All right. The classic view, which is what, what I'm presenting here, is that <coughs> uh, um, in the creation of the universe, right, in the creation of the universe, all right, God creates the universe in the image and, in his own image and likeness. Right? It's a copy. What does it copy? There's an idea in the mind of God, right? just as an artist, just as an artist must have an idea of something he's going to paint, therefore that idea becomes the model and his work becomes the copy. So in the creation of the universe, and God in creating the universe looked upon it and said it was good, it was good, it was good, means that he reflected back on it and made the judgment about it being good. He must have had the idea of good or he couldn't have made the judgment. Therefore, the idea of good is the model upon which he judges the efficacy of his production. Therefore, there is this idea, right, that's behind all creation. Therefore, if we want to put that as the primary idea which is being manifested in the entire development of creation, then that's the primary cause of everything, and therefore it has contained within it all possible evolutions and all possible transformations. And that's the way the classicist answers the modern. Well, how, well, how, how can you have within the good... Pardon me? Uh, how can you have within the good uh, bad, because there is... Pardon me, do it again? The manifest. How does it become manifest? I, I'll do it again, I didn't do it. Uh, okay. Um, except with the good has the idea and the idea has to be good because it comes from the good or from God. That's true. Then with the, uh, are you just doing with the emanations there is a draining and therefore it, you do have the 
the bad becomes manifest? No, sure. Okay. I was going to go, we're now going for the draining, all right? We're now, I just needed this in order to go to the drain idea, all right? <clears throat> if, if God is intelligent enough to go through this process and could make something better than himself, then if there was any intelligence in God, he should have first used it to make himself better. <laughs> no, 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 no. <clears throat> no. That, that, that's the way they answer this. This is the way in terms of metaphysics. Therefore, if there was a creation that drained him and the creation was greater than his own idea, then in principle he should have used that to, cre to improve himself rather than create something which in fact drained him and made him less than he was. God's image, mm -hmm. there can't be bad in God. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> the idea of bad in this system is can't be evil because that's a demonic force that opposes the good and that doesn't exist in this kind of a system. That's right. Right. Uh, the, uh, the basic idea of good and bad here is that all men, all men desire the good. No matter what it is they desire, they wouldn't desire it unless they called it good. We may be mistaken about what we call the good, but it's no doubt about the fact that everybody seeks whatever it is they perceive as good. Right. And we go through our lives, through many a turmoil, only to discover that the thing we thought was good wasn't really as good as what we thought, and therefore we have to get a better good, and that's our own development. Well, we're assuming anthropomorphic God, aren't we? Yes, that's why. You see, only, only highly developed cultures can have an anthropomorphic God. Oh yeah, only, only most, most ideal cultures can have an anthropomorphic God. That's absolutely right. We used to think it was the opposite, but it's not. Oh yeah, it's quite, quite amazing to have an anthropomorphic God. Quite true. Yeah, especially if you add to it wisdom and good and things like that. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, anthropomorphic. That's right. Yeah. That's the likeness. See, that's the like. There must be something about God. There must be some commonness. See, so, <clears throat> take the higher and the lower. Let's make another step. All right? Equally well, notice, call this A, call this C. Like our main analogy. All right? There is a part of A, there is now, we can talk about the part of A that is AB. There's the part of C that we can now talk about as BA, isn't it? Right? By heavens. Yeah, yeah. Now, what does that mean? It's the same thing mathematically, whether you say 2 times 3, 3 times 2, but not in this game, because whatever is participating in other, regardless of what it is, all right, there is a likeness. Now, what do we mean by likeness? All right, now we're going to take the idea of likeness in terms of same and other, all right? There must be, if the A is going to be like, all right, if there's going to be a likeness generated by this participation, then one part of it is going to be greater, a greater like, a greater sameness, a greater sameness, that's this part, and this is going to have a greater, I mean, a less, right, a different, a different quality to it. Therefore, if this is something, let us call it, that is eternal, right, then part of what participates in it, part of what's going to participate in it, is going to be enduring, and part is going to be transitory. Whatever is participating, if it's like, there must always be something that's the same, another thing that's different in order to have a likeness. Therefore, that's the likeness, uh, pardon me, that's the same and different. Well, how can you say that he is eternal too? You said enduring, why not say eternal? Well, okay. See, the argument is, if it is, if it is eternal, right? if, if they are both eternal and they participate, then why are they participating? They have to participate for something that one of them doesn't have. So then we'll have to describe, all right, what kinds of things participate 
in one another that are both eternal. Whatever it is that's going to be different, that difference is going to be shared totally, partially. Totally, partially, either talk about in terms of time, enduringly, transitively. So, uh, you can take, uh, <clears throat> well, matter of fact, I have it right here. Here, let me, let me do it. Uh, um. Let's see if I can take this off here. I don't think we need this anymore. <clears throat> because now we can shift and talk about all right if if God is one right? we can also say since every religion holds this to be true we can also say the highest expression of the nature of God is the one Now, if there's anything that's going to be generated, if it's going to be generated by like terms, if that's what's always going to be produced, is going to be like terms, then the closest thing to one, yet different, is going to be unity. Okay. Whatever then is going to be generated from unity that's going to be determined is going to be things in a unity. Now, uh, now, this is participation, see? Therefore, these things that participate in unity, I'm going to use this as a measure of participating, <clears throat> then each of the things that participate in it are themselves a unit, a unit, a unit. Now, in this game, uh, let's now use this image. If there is the one, the other side of the idea of one is the good. All right. It's called the good because all things desire the good. Therefore, on the side of uh, objects of desire, we talk about the good in terms of the one we talk about the highest way in which to express it. There is an essential identity between the idea of the one and the good. There's an essential way in which you can say those two are the same, that is to say identical. We can go into that in a few minutes. All right. But now look here. If the one then is full and overflows, all right, it reverts and turns upon itself it reverts and turns upon itself because it desires its own source. In desiring its own source then, it encounters it. In that encounter, that's what we mean by being. <clears throat> in the fact that it is in this pursuit, <clears throat> it's in this pursuit, what, it, what necessarily is involved in its very quest is vitality. And the fact that it recognizes its source, <clears throat> intelligence. <clears throat> Therefore, you know what we can say then? That this idea of unity, right? What participates in it is this threesome. We'll put it in terms of a triangle, being, vitality, and intelligence. Now, they must have a unitary mode of being, but if there is something that is unitary, that presupposes there must be unity before it. The condition for something always precedes the thing that has the quality. Right? 
red apples. The idea of red must precede the whole idea of red apples. There couldn't be red apples. Right. Therefore, if these can be said to be in a unity, distinguishable by reasoning, which is what we're doing, that presupposes the idea of unity must have preceded the unity of these three things, since the condition of unity must precede the things that are in a unity. Agree? Ah, now look here. <clears throat> Where did they get these terms? Where did they get these terms? Where do these terms come from? All of these terms are just to do one thing. And that is, all right, in man's highest experience, <clears throat> one gains an insight into the nature of ultimate reality. In that experience of ultimate reality, it is an overwhelming, joyous experience. And when, what, when, when one recognizes that what one is encountering is no different than what is encountered, and the act of seeing it, visualizing it, experiencing it, knowing it, intellecting it is the same. In other words, there's no difference between one uses one's intellect, all right, at that point one uh, encounters intelligence which is intelligible in that highest experience the use of the intellect when encounters what is in fact intelligence which is intelligible all right do it again one uses the intellect and one discovers by heavens when encounters mind no difference. No difference between the intellect, intellecting, and the object of intellection. They're all the same. One. Now, when that experience occurs, some people want to sit back and say, what does it mean? How can I understand it? That's what they do. They so sit around and say, I've got to put this in terms. I have to understand this. This is a worthy object of understanding. It starts from these experiences. And therefore, someone comes along and says, hey, you know what? This experience, brilliant, radiant, luminosity, pure light of being, most brilliant light of being, in Tibetan thought, the same thing, right? Which they call... Uh, um, this is called the uh, experience of the pure intellect shining, empty, shining, blissful. And the uh, Chikai Bardo plan. Right? Now, <clears throat> they're trying to now focus on this. Hey, you know what? It's not this. It's not this. That's dead. That light doesn't look like. It's not it's distant. It's not me. In this experience, one encounters, therefore, something that is most intensely and has the most intense vitality. Hey, it's real more than anything else is real, being. Hey, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's alive, it's vitality alive, it's being is a greater reality and the whole thing one encounters is no different than one's own mind, intelligence. What do they do? They wanted to figure out what is contained in this experience. They came up therefore with these three ideas. What ideas? Being, vitality, intelligence. That's what they came. Now, if they can put that nature of that experience in terms of words and concepts and try to understand it most fully, which would be the highest term? Oh, wait a minute now. There are some things that exist but don't have any vitality. Oh, 
There are some things that have vitality that don't have intellect. Oh, therefore this must be higher. And this second, this third. Oh, then this must be the highest term. Yeah, mm -hmm, that's the highest term. If that's the highest term, what can we say about it? Then, how did this ever come into existence? How did this ever come into existence? What's the reason this ever came into existence? What's the source of it? Look here, when someone experiences this, they've got several questions. One is, how come? That's all, how come? How come they got it? It demands, it demands an explanation. Now look here, if these three things are in a unity, if these things are in a unity, there are three things in a unity, that presupposes there must be something called unity, unity that precedes it. Oh, oh, but wait a minute, doesn't unity naturally follow from, I mean you can't have unity unless you have the prior concept of the one. Now watch the next step what they do, all right? If this is the highest experience as experience, and this is presupposed by analysis, and this is presupposed, does that mean then there's something higher than the highest experience? Yes, but it's not an experience. It's not an object of experience. Therefore, by analysis of this, by reasoning through it with these kinds of terms, they see the necessity to posit two things. And now some people are going to say, wait a minute, are these things just intellectual constructions that follow logically from an analysis of the elements? Or does it have some significance in its own right? Hypothesis, this is their hypothesis. Their whole game comes out to be in one statement. The very process of understanding this prepares the mind for this and this. Not as an object of experience. An object of experience can be determined, can be described, right? You can assign predicates to it. You can say it's this and this. I can talk about it as, look at the terms I used. Therefore, what's beyond this, no terms. Right? Therefore, wait a minute now, it has to have terms that aren't terms. What's that? Well, as an example, Meister Eckhart, the great mystic of the 12th century, right? he, had, he had this. couldn't fit it within Catholic theology, came up with a great idea. He said, this really is another way of understanding the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He said, I got it. And he argued in the following way. He said, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, either one you want. It's the unity of these three that necessarily, that necessarily is higher than any of the three. Therefore he coined a new term. He said, that's the Godhead. That's the Godhead. The unity that binds the three into one. That's the Godhead. Now, that idea of Godhead is not an experience. It's not an experience per se. It's a state of openness. That is unity. And in Greek, the word for unity is a henad. And therefore, that's the doctrine of the henads. Now, wait a minute. Can there be something beyond that? Yep, the one about which nothing can be said at all. And that's called the dia negativa. Right? Dia negativa, the God about which you can say nothing. Right? No terms, no description, no experience. Pure awareness, pure consciousness. 
And you know what? Wait a minute, you can't talk about consciousness unless you have an object. What do you mean pure consciousness? Does that mean you can define consciousness? Yeah, sure, 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 go ahead. <laughs> See, it's always in relation to something else. So therefore, that's where this proceeds. This is where it proceeds. Now, let me see now if I can go one more step for you. Everything, therefore, in this system follows this way. The one, he adds, being intelligence, vitality, soul. And the quality of the highest term passes through through all of the terms. So as you can see, would you agree? The highest, the highest has a greater range of a participation of terms than the second. And the third has less than the second. Let's do it again. One. The first impacts all. The second can only impact the second and the third. The third can only impact the fourth. Therefore, which one has the greatest range of terms? The highest. Therefore, anything that you can say that is to any degree, to the degree that you can distinguish it and talk about it, it's a one. Agree? A one. Therefore, the one, A one, is the most extensive term applying to all things. Wait a minute, second term. Would you agree? If it's a one, even on the gross level, right, there must be a unity of its parts. Ah! Unity. Wait a minute. It must be able to participate in some way, in some kind of existence. Vitality? Not much. Intelligence? Kind of dumb. But therefore, would you agree, each one of these carries out within its members and therefore proliferates the level of the universe such that all of these qualities then finally end up in the physical manifestation of our universe, which is nothing other than the participation in all of these ideas depending upon the particular thing and its capacity to receive it. <clears throat> Let me go back. All right? This is central point. The degree to which individuals have the openness and the capacity to receive the higher, they get it. That's the idea of providence in this system. Therefore, it's a generalized grace without being specific. Therefore, here we have a man, right, man, right? Here's a, a bottle of, a great bottle of, what shall we have it here? Bottle of what? Well, Port? Port? All right. <laughs> Chair. Would you agree each of these is one? Now, would you go further and say the difference between a chair and a bottle is what? At least we have one thing hard, one thing flowing. Structure, right? structure different kind of structure. All right. Suppose we have over here a cat. Would you agree whatever we're talking about, we can say it participates to some degree in one, Unity of its parts, being, vitality, intelligence, whatever it is, must participate to some degree in these things. Therefore, all things, whatever they are, necessarily share in the gods. Because what the Greeks mean by gods are unities. Any unity they call a god. And they reserve the word god the highest term for the one. Therefore, when they talk about the gods, they mean nothing other than unity. Different kinds of unitary. Pure ideas, unitary ideas. All right? There are six of them. All right? And these six, therefore, carry down through all of these things. All right? And let's take a look at them. Luckily enough, I have them here on the piece of paper. What are they? Right? Let's quickly get them. Protecting, purifying, purifying, perfecting, turning around, turning around, sometimes called conversion, turning about, 
right? Vitalizing and generating. These are the basic ideas. Therefore, for in here, unities, what they call gods, each one has a particular characteristic of the six I just mentioned. And therefore, anything that exists here that can participate in any one of those, it protects it, right? What does it do? It purifies it, right? See what it does? Take a look, see? And that's why each one of these particular unities is a particular kind of excellence. The excellence it has is a way of showing goodness. Therefore, all of the gods here particularize in one of the ways in which things can be said to be good. Therefore, each of these unities is an excellence. What kind of excellence? a goodness. It has a particular excellence which is necessarily a goodness. How many are they? Six. Let's take a look, right? Notice, and I'll, I'll quit right now as soon as I just uh, make sure that you see my list. Purifying, protecting, perfecting, turning around, vitalizing, generating. Right? Now, each one of the ideas I mentioned can be explored in greater depth than Proclus. And that's what I took you through. Yeah, go ahead. In Genesis. Yes, yes. There was a cell, seven Elohim. It sounds like they might have been, somebody might have got some ideas from the Greeks. And in Genesis, it says the Elohim, and we, we uh, fashioned God in our image. Yes, that's true. Six, sixth day. That's right. That's right. There are many similarities. Actually, the greater similarities between Prometheus and uh, the Old Testament Genesis than there is uh, anywhere else. Curious, very interesting relationships. Also, the analogical relationships and the generation of the of the creation, you know, uh, has a very interesting order. Uh, one is to four, is two, is to five, is three, is to six. It's proportionate. The whole thing is proportionate. And you can line up the days. One is to four, is two, is to five, is three, is to six. So you can see the way it's structured. Yeah, same. It has a very interesting analogical development. Therefore. Hold it, here we go, ready? At the last line on page two, the gods are present alike to all things. Each order has a share in their presence, proportion to its station and its capacity, its capacity to receive it. And all inferior principles retreat before the presence of the gods. Those are two quotes I pulled out of Proclus because do you see? Right. Since it's necessarily that each one of these is a unifying excellence, and as a unifying excellence, it has a particular goodness, six ideas, right? Therefore, it is, therefore, permeates the universe, and therefore, since each one of these can be found in the physical universe, the physical universe is nothing other than impacted by the gods. Therefore, Proclus's great conclusion is the gods are present alike to all things, right? That's what he says about it. Right. Now, I did a little, uh, I tried to pull together some things for you in this reflection drawn upon Proclus. All that has desire turns to the object of its desire. Whatever is desired is desired because it's perceived as good. Hence, all things desire the good, and each has a desire to discover and to learn of its cause, and seeks to be conjoined to it. Thus, each attains it through the mediation of its own proximate cause. Therefore, each has a desire of its own cause also. Through that which gives it its being, it attains its well-being. And its well-being is what belongs to whatever it is that is brought into existence. Since what gives us being furnishes us with the, the well-being essential for our own existence. Thus, the source of its well-being is the primary object of desire. The primary object of its desire is that upon which it reverts. For in seeking the source of one's being, one turns about upon oneself. Thus, everything whose nature it is revert, right, is to revert, reverts upon that, upon that from which it derived the procession of its own substance. For if it reverts by nature, it has usian desire of that upon which it reverts. And if so, its being also is wholly dependent on the principle upon which it reverts, usian. And it is, right, and in its usia it resembles the latter. 
Hence, it's naturally sympathetic with this principle. Hence, it is akin to it in existence. I put a lot of Proclus in there and a little essay for you. Now, there's one word I want you to look at. It's new to you. We used it in some of the other lectures we had. Usia. All right. A lot of people translate this as essence. <clears throat> but there aren't many people who can distinguish between the use of the word essence and being. But it has a very special meaning, and I'd like to point this out to you, all right? This whole system depends upon one assumption, that in any development of anything, it reverts upon its cause. It reverts upon its cause. Wherever it is in this hierarchy, it can revert upon its cause. Therefore, intrinsic to the nature of reality, in the very nature of existence itself, there is this power of reverting back upon its source, reverting back upon oneself. That's a, an essential feature of the very nature of our reality. That ability to turn upon oneself right, is necessarily non-physical because nothing can turn upon itself that's physical, right? You can't do it. If you mean by reverting upon itself where all parts of itself fall upon itself, that's impossible. <coughs> Therefore, that's a metaphysical reversion upon itself. It takes a special word, and that's the word usia. That capacity we all have, right, to reflect upon ourselves. Anything that is living that has intelligence, that has vitality, necessarily must be able to do that, or it doesn't have intelligence. Right? The degree to which it has intelligence, that degree it can revert and turn upon itself. And turning upon itself, it either turn upon itself or return upon its higher, its cause. Those two things, therefore, are essential for the evolution of man, spiritual evolution of man, which is to return to one's source. We're here, <clears throat> here we are, in the fourth stage, soul and body, soul encapsulated in a body. Therefore, we can gain interesting experiences by discovering the nature of soul, the nature of intelligence, the nature of unity, the one. The distinctive character of the divine powers is that it radiates downwards, purifying, protecting, perfecting, turning around, turning about, vitalizing and generating, since anything that is full has that capacity to generate of itself something like itself. All right, therefore, anything that is full and ready. And here is the whole essay on the nature of the one. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Alan Watts used to say that God was eternally playing hide and go seek. That's right. That's what was one of his great ones. I like another one he used to say. Man is an ego encapsulated in a bag of skin. Would you repeat that thing? Alan? Yeah. Alan used to say, man is an ego encapsulated in a bag of skin. Well. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you very much. These are your sheets. I hope you can use them if you're interested. This is, I think, might be a helpful way to get into Proclus. If so, my efforts have achieved their good.